Councillor Shirley Smart is coming up the stairs and uh, we want to give her a little bit of time to get here. She should be here shortly. Have we had apologies from Councillor Fuller? Okay, we're going to officially start now. We've got, we'll just wait for Shirley to get into her seat. I know the lift wasn't working, which is not good. Okay, uh, welcome everyone uh, to the public and press. Uh, just to introduce uh, the, the officers that are presiding tonight. Um, Ollie Bolter, Strategic Manager for Planning and Infrastructure. Russell Chick, Planning Team Leader. Uh, Stuart Van Kuhlenberg, Principal Planning Officer. Alan White, the Highways Representative. Uh, ben Gard, Legal Advisor. And Marie Bartlett, Committee Clerk. Uh, Councillor Fuller, as the Cabinet Member of Planning and Community engagement has a seat there, but has as yet not come. Uh, Paul, Councillor Paul Brady is being substituted by Councillor Ian Ward. So welcome, Ian, tonight. And I would like to welcome Councillor Lu uh, Karen Lucioni, who's actually, uh, and <laughs> I've got a thumbs up on her, getting her name right, which has taken me many years uh, <laughs> to uh, uh, now be on the committee. So um, welcome. Uh, we do have actually uh, apologies, sadly, from Councillor Beston, Price and Warren, um, who have given their, their apologies, uh, and they have good reasons to not be here. Uh, there are no planned fire drills during the meeting. If you hear the fire alarm sound, please treat it as a real emergency and evacuate the building via the nearest, safest escape route. The nearest escape route is via the signposted set of stairs to your uh, left as you leave the council chamber or public gallery. Exit via the door at the back of the building. Walk across the inner car park around the building to the evacuation point, which is the pavement uh, opposite the police station. The lifts can't be used in the event of emergency, as we actually know they're not working. <laughs> so. Uh, Please don't go into them. Uh, please don't re-enter the building until you're advised it's safe to do so by a council member of staff. Please also, we are under um, COVID, um, so if you are moving around, uh, i.e. Uh, if there's breaks and you're going to um, the toilets, etc., please can you put your mask on? And when you leave, uh, can you wear your mask? I request mobile phones are switched off or to moot. And I request that all speakers use the microphones in front of you. Uh, if they're not working, someone will come and assist you. Uh, I request that no food is consumed during the meeting unless it is for medical need. And I wish to remind members that they cannot leave the council chamber as councillors on the committee during the presentation or debate to, to honour an application. If they leave, they'll be unable to vote on that application. Uh, if there's a necessary for comfort breaks, we will, uh, I will uh, make that discretion. Remind members of the public, both in the room and watching virtually over there, that you are present purely to observe the process and you will not be permitted to speak uh, unless you are registered to speak in advance with the speakers uh, over there. 
Uh, for the speakers uh, tonight, I'll just run through the lighting system. Uh, you'll see a little green light up there. Uh, when you are asked to speak, the green light will display. There, I think there's one over there in the corner. Uh, when you have 30 seconds left, the amber light will display. And when the red light displays, I will stop you talking. You'll also get a buzzer uh, within there. This is to ensure that all parties receive the same amount of time and that the process is seen to be fair. Uh, we do have one speaker that is actually online and uh, they will be cut off by Marie when they've spoken their particular uh, time. Okay, oh, um, just to say that Councillor Fuller uh, is attending virtually, so uh, apologise, Paul, didn't know you were there virtually. Okay, uh, are you fully understood of that? that thank you we'll now move to the agenda and the first uh, item is the minutes of the last meeting i will now propose the minutes as a true record for the approval do i have a seconder i have a seconder councillor brody that we will then go to the vote Councillor Jarman. Chairman, there was a, a proposed amendment circulated before the meeting to the minutes. Do you wish to consider that first? Are you making that, you're making that as an official amendment? I did, yes, and I do now. You, okay, do I have a seconder for that amendment? I don't have a second, I have a seconder. Uh, Councillor Adams. We would have to deal with the amendment first. Do you wish to speak to the amendment, Councillor Jarman? Yes, thank you, Chairman. First of all, I'd like to check. I've just heard from some of my colleagues that they haven't received it. I think it was left on the table as well this evening as being emailed out. Uh, th there were a number of points, key points, uh, which I found to be missing in the draft version of the minutes that were circulated. I've limited myself here very specifically to those key points rather than to generalities or detail, which was not necessary. These key points, however, were quite material to the debate and to the proceedings of the last meeting. They also have considerable bearing on other applications which are due before the committee. And so I was extraordinarily keen that these points although, of course, they're on the recording, uh, were added in here. As I said, they are only uh, four very specific and key points, and I would commend them. I have circulated them before and have not received uh, any adverse comments at all to them. Councillor Bowley. I'm very disappointed that once again, Councillor Jarman has chosen to uh, attempt to amend accurate minutes of this committee um, to his own advantage. I also find the lack of spe specificness of these amendments quite puzzling. To start off with, the first one says add between paragraphs one and two. Doesn't tell me which paragraph one or two. I have about, let's see, seven, eight pages of minutes, it doesn't refer to which page. Secondly, the second one says add a time interval 123. Thankfully, we do not minute by the second and the minute on this council, and I'm not aware of any public authority in the country that minutes on specific times, so I'm not quite sure where that one is supposed to be inserted. The third one says correct the paragraph on page five starting a proposal if councillor jarman checks there are two paragraphs on page five that begin with a proposal so once again we don't know which one that refers to and finally the fourth one suggests an amendment regarding the proposed reason for refusal based on reduced objections now that if if anything's general i don't know what it, what it what isn't 
to be frank, he refers to not wanting to be general, but to refer to reduced objections, when it was quite clear that the refusal reason that was proposed and accepted by Councillor Critchison at that meeting was Freshwater Neighbourhood Plan Policy 12. It was very specific. So if you're going to amend that, I think it at least should be that. I do think to bring this sort of half-baked amendment to the minutes is once again an example of the way in which staff who are served in this committee have been disrespected. Thank you, Chair. I hope we reject it. Thank you, Councillor Brody. Councillor Quirk. Uh, I agree that the, the, the minutes proposed amendment is inaccurate. Uh, and I propose we go straight to the vote on this and don't waste time on it. Thank you, Quirk. Uh, Councillor Quirk, I'm glad to you put that forward. Uh, can we go to the vote on the amendment to as put forward? Those uh, for the amendment? Those against? And those uh, abstentions? Three. Uh, abstentions. Can you put your hands up for abstentions again? Yeah. We'll, we'll now go to the proposal for the minutes put forward to, by myself and uh, seconded by Councillor Brody. Uh, those for approving the minutes? Those against? Abstentions? The minutes are approved. I will sign them. We now move on to item two, and the declarations of interest. Councillor Jarman. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair, with your leave. Um, first of all, I have no personal pecuniary interest uh, in the PTEC planning application or the companies involved, save that as all councillors, I'm entitled to an allowance from Isla White Council uh, that is donated to a local trust in support of disadvantaged young people and similar needs in my own ward of Totland and Colwell. The Alliance Group, of which I'm a member and for which I serve on our cabinet, upholds a core principle of openness and transparency. My position on that cabinet and my portfolio role on the council requires me to clarify two areas under declaration of interest. Firstly, as briefly covered in the planning report before the committee this evening, relating to the council interests, and secondly, regarding my personal disposition on the matter. Regarding the first area, the council has a pecuniary interest in the application, having one, made an investment in the scheme, number two, by virtue of a shareholding, and number three, potential future council revenue generation should the planning permission be granted through various payments, uh, offtake agreements, birth rentals, and potentially to realise a capital receipt. It is on this basis that the planning department has called the matter to this planning committee. As noted in the Isle of Wight Council Statement of Accounts regarding the investment of one million in PTEC, the council had previously invested one million pound over two years under a loan agreement repayable after nine years in a joint venture company known as PTEC, holding 15% of the ordinary shares in the company with rights to dividends and a position on the board. In September 2020, 
the Council agreed to authorise PTEC to raise additional funds required to renew consenting licences by selling up to two-thirds of the Council's shareholding in the company. In addition, the Council's originally loan term was extended for five years and is now repayable alongside the other loan which capitalised the company and the Council released its position on the PTEC board for the avoidance of doubt. Although this means that the Council will be foregoing its ability to direct the work of the company and also the benefits of any future dividends from its shares, the Council recognised that there is no likelihood of any dividend should the project fail at this juncture. These changes were also made in the spirit of the original intent for PTEC to create jobs and investment and put the Isle of Wight at the forefront of renewable energy. It is important to note that, in addition to the above statement and from a financial point of view, we add interest to the loan on a quarterly basis. The loan balance currently stands at £1,106,363. On the second area, relating to my personal disposition, I remain open-minded, but have sought extensive opinion given the combination of my specific role on the Council and the Council's financial interests. Said advice has been sought from colleagues, our regeneration and finance departments, from the head of legal, from the monitoring officer and others. All have provided input, save from the monitoring officer who has not replied. Our constitution appears to offer little assistance, and I fully acknowledge that previous planning committee participation by finance portfolio holders may have been decided differently according to the view of the respective member at that time. The key advice upon which I have decided not to partake in this particular item comes from the Planning Advisory Service Probate in Planning, which states in relation to such considerations, in small councils, it may be necessary for a portfolio holder to be on a planning committee. Planning Advisory Service suggests that in these situations, they will need to be extremely careful and will need to withdraw when the committee is considering the council's own schemes. Whilst this is not specifically a council scheme, I have decided that my own participation in the debate or voting on the matter, given the combination of council financial involvement and my respective portfolio of finance, whilst not formally prejudicial, could be seen as in conflict and hence may compromise any decision made this evening. I will therefore not participate in the debate and will abstain from all voting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor John. Can we move to item three, public question time? Uh, I'm looking up there. I have three questions which were submitted in writing. Uh, I have a uh, Kerry Fosbury on there, a Dom Hicklin, no, and a uh, Lindsay Becker, no. Okay, I will read them out. Oh, sorry, are they? Are any of them there? Sorry. No. Is, is Kerry Fosbury there, Linda Becker there, or Dom Hecklin? No, I will uh, read the questions out and the responses, uh, and I will, uh, they will be sent to them in writing. Uh, first question, written question from Dom Hecklin to, um, to the chairman. The NPPF Section 30 plus the circulated recent government reply to the Council leader and your noted comments by the Planning Advisory Service and the local government association all reinforce the significant weight to be given to neighbourhood plans such as Benbridge, Gurnards and Freshwaters. Why is this weight ignored by Council planning staff? The response is, the weight to be given to neighbourhood plans is not ignored by planning officers. 
A neighbourhood plan once brought into force forms part of the overall development plan, including the NPPF and the island plan core strategy, against which, which decisions must be made. Paragraph 30 of the NPPF states that the policies of a neighbourhood plan will take precedent over existing non-strategic policies in a local plan. In this case, the island plan core strategy, where they, are in uh, where they are in conflict. It is not a situation where significant weight is given to one plan or another. Although the NPPF recognises that there may be conflicts between a neighbourhood plan and the local plan, in reality, any conflict should be minor given the requirement for a neighbourhood plan to be in general conformity with the local plan as set out in the NPPF. Second question. The motion to, this is from Kerry Fosbury. The, the motion to reject the application of Birch Close by Councillor Christensen included freshwater neighbourhood plan policies 6C, 6G, 11, 12 and 13. Yet the planning staff replied that only a motion based on FNP 13 would be appropriate. On what basis did planning staff find the key, the other key at FNP, that's the Freshwater Neighbourhood Plan, policy areas deficient for inclusion in the motion? Response. During the debate, a, pro a proposal to refuse the planning application on the grounds of the Losser Greenfield site the ecological impact and, the, and that the site was outside of the settled settlement boundary was put forwarded and seconded. Officers gave detailed advice regarding the points of, of objection that were raised as to whether in their professional view they would amount to sustainable reasons for a refusal in the event of an appeal. Following further debate, Councillor Richardson spoke directly to officers that her concerns could be set out in a potential reason for refusal. Officers drafted the reason and provided the policies considered relevant to the concerns that had been raised, including those within the Freshwater Neighbourhood Plan. Given the concerns raised, which focus on the loss of a green field, the impact to ecology and the lack of information for biodiversity net gain, Officers advised that the policy FNP 12 would be relevant, not FNP 13 as referenced in the question. And that freshwater neighbourhood plan policies 6C, 6G, 11 and 13 were not relevant to the reasons put forward in the proposal to refuse the application. The reason for refusal was then read out to all councillors and the chairman then asked Councillor Christians whether the reason read out was acceptable. Councillor Christian confirmed that the reason gave the, rights, the right reasons for the issues she had raised. Thank you. A last question. This is from Lindsay Becker. The briefings at Freshwater Library by the Cabinet Member for Planning and to Freshwater Parish Council by planning officers, reported that Freshwater Neighbourhood Plan represent the most significant document to defend against excessive development. That consistent advice formed the foundations of objections to Birch Close, including the Freshwater Parish Council. Following objections, Freshwater Parish Council and the Ward Council's con Councillor's contribution the planning staff interjected, stating that the more recent release of the NPPF superseded the Freshwater Neighbourhood Plan. What changed between the local briefings and the planning committee meeting to diminish the weight of the Freshwater Neighbourhood Plan? The briefings from, from Councillor Fuller directly pointed to the protection afforded by the FNP, why was this crucial document withheld from the advanced briefing paper circulated to the committee and also from the website, resulting in the committee 
members being unaware of the important policy content and unable to consider their relevance and debate them. Response. The weight given to the Freshwater Neighbour Plan has not changed. The NPPF does not supersede the FNP. These documents, along with the Island Plan core strategy, form the development plan against which applications are considered. If there is a conflict between policies in the development plan, the conflict must be resolved in favour of the policy which contained in the last document to become part of the development plan. Officers highlight that the revived, revived NPPF was published after the Freshwater Neighbourhood Plan. The FNP was clearly referenced in the officer's report that was considered by the planning committee. The report was made available to members of the planning committee and published in the public domain on Monday the 8th of November, a full week before the planning committee meeting on Tuesday the 16th of November. The FNP has been available on the council's website since it was made and came into force on the 12th of March, 2018. Is there any questions from the gallery? No, I will now end question time. We now move on to report of the strategic manager for planning and infrastructure. We have the planning application which is 21-01623 full. This is a full planning permission for the onshore elements of the Perpetuous Tidal Energy Centre, known as PTEC, to include construction of a substation control room, including outdoor transformer, compound and welfare facilities, alterations to access parking and turning arrangements, insulation of cabling to connect marine electricity export cables to substation, to include trenching and construction of transition pits and or horizontal direction drilling, and temporary removal and reinstatement of coastal protection, and enabling works including possible reinforcement or alteration of access roads within the onshore area. Creation of temporary lay down construction areas, construction of temporary site, security fencing provisions, possible tree and scrub clearance, site levelling landscaping, by description at Flowers Brook, Steep Hill Road, Ventnor Isla White, PO 381 UB. I will now turn to the case officer, uh, Stuart, to um, do your presentation. Thank you. If everyone just bear with, um, I think uh, we've got quite used to technical issues uh, in, the, in this case, so if you just bear with us, we soon we'll be there. Thanks, Chairman. Sorry about the delay. 
Um, so, uh, as the chairman's explained, councillors, the application relates to um, the provision of an onshore substation uh, at a site in Denver called Flowers Brook. Um, that is to uh, serve the offshore uh, tidal energy centre um, that's received licensing consent from the MMO. Um, in terms of the general location, so members get their bearing, a reminder of, of where we are. Um, the area, uh, the application site comprises of uh, Flowersbrook, the residential property here, um, and a residential caravan park. Uh, there is an existing pumping station, uh, and that uh, has its own little compound uh, and access um, via uh, the caravan site um, and on uh, through the open space. Flowersbrook open space is here, and the site is located. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. So again, uh, the site is to the south of Steep Hill Road, um, comprises the residential property Flowersbrook here, um, the residential caravan park, the open space known as Flowersbrook, and to the west, we have Ventnor Park. Uh, there's residential properties off Steep Hill Road here. Um, there are also residential properties to the west of the site and to the north. Um, and further to the west, we have Ventnor Cricket Club. Um, there is an access road through here, uh, which leads down to Castle Cove and then onwards to Steep Hill Cove. Just so uh, members have got the extent of the site in their minds, um, the Flowersbrook property is here on Canberra Park here. Um, the western extent of the site generally follows the alignment of the boundary of Flowersbrook, Caravan Park and dwelling, um, and that extends out to the intertidal area um, and the foreshore, which is marked by the mean low water mark. Um, the eastern boundary of site follows the eastern extent of the access road um, and is just before um, the Flowersbrook watercourse, which runs from north um, through the site to the uh, sea. Um, there's also a pipeline here um, at, at the sea level, um, which effectively uh, marks the uh, eastern extent of the site as well. Um, the compound, uh, these pumping stations located here, um, the compound is in this general footprint, and the substation is proposed within the southwestern corner. Just a couple of photos to remind members from their from the visit. The uh, stone wall of the southern water compound to the open space is shown here, um, and the gated access. And this is generally taken from the public open space. Um, the access track again, and the southern water pumping station. This uh, photo is taken from the south, uh, looking towards the north. Uh, again, we can see the stone wall and the pumping station site. And looking across the open space to the east, residential properties at higher level. Um, and again. Um, we can just see the access track here leading to Castle Cove in the foreground. Looking at the proposed uh, application set up within the Southern Water Compound, we have the substation footprint that is generally within the southwestern corner. It's about 30 metres in width and 12 metres in depth at this end. Um, the Southern Water uh, building is retained and the intervening areas generally used for parking and turning. The stone wall is also retained as well as gated access and the existing access would be utilised via the caravan park site. In terms of the uh, proposed elevations, this is the northern elevation that would be seen. Um, again, the arrow indicates where this is looking at for members. Uh, and again, this is looking from the pumping station towards the uh, proposed building. Um, down at the bottom, it shows the general mix of proposed materials, which comprises a mix of stone walling, um, art uh, composite timber cladding um, here, uh, stone walling through here, and then a mix of metal and composite timber cladding through the rest of the elevations. This is the elevation that you would see um, from the public open space. Um, and general members will see that I've marked on the heights to give you an idea. It's 7.3 metres at this end and 6.5 metres at this end. This would be the elevation that would be seen from the caravan park. Um, again, members will note the indicative layout of the approved residential development within the caravan park, and that shows the relationship to the substation building. Uh, again, the elevations range from a height of about five metres uh, at this end of the building at the western end um, to about 6.5 metres at the eastern end, and it rises to the maximum height of eight metres in the approximate centre, which is about a metre lower than the existing ridge height of the pumping station building. 
Again, finally, the final elevation, just looking at the end elevation here on the western side, again, which would be aspecting towards the adjacent residential caravan park. In terms of a cross section, just to give members an idea of levels, the finished floor level here of the post building is roughly the same height uh, of the top of the stone wall. The stone wall is about 1.5 metres in height above the open space. And again, members have got an idea of heights through here. So again, we've got about 6.8 metres here. And then again, it rises uh, to 7.5 metres through here and then lowers as it comes towards the residential um, site across here to 5.5 metres, again, being set down about a metre. In terms of wider context elevation for the substation, the substation is shown here with the massing and height of the, post of the existing sunwater pumping station and the indicated stone wall, just to give members an idea of how it sits the site contours. And then again, an artist depression. Um, I would just caution that this is indicative um, submitted by the applicant, but again, it gives an impression of how it would look from the open space. And again, you can see the existing stone wall feature that would remain. This house's impression is taken. It's looking southwards. Um, again, this is the access to the approach down to Castle Cove here. And again, you can see the general massing and appearance that would be indicated of the substation building from that vantage point. To give members an idea of, of wider context, uh, officers have walked um, the ex uh, wider areas. Um, on the left hand side here, this is taken from the street scene and the existing access to the caravan park. And again, members will note the hedgerow and tree screening generally along this boundary. Um, with the pumping station site being over in this direction. Officers have also gone uh, to the higher ground um, to the north, and this is um, a photo taken looking towards the caravan park here. And again, the application site is located over in this direction, which is fairly visible. Um, members will also, um, uh, yeah, uh, then looking on the right hand side, um, we've walked the uh, coastal paths to the e uh, the paths along the cliffs to the east. And again, these run from the open space back on itself and come up back towards the um, steep access that members would have walked down. And again, members will note that you're generally looking at the open space and towards the western extent and southern extent of the caravan parks and not towards the application site, which is more in this direction and benefits from better screening. A general artist's impression of what the building would look like from internal to the site and again, how it would sit into the general contours and levels within the proposed uh, within the compound. Turning to the other associated works, um, the uh, proposal also involves cabling, uh, potential cabling and trenching options to link the offshore um, energy centre to the proposed substation. The indicated cabling routes are shown here in purple, and they would generally follow the alignment of the access track um, and would follow the co follow down into Castle Cove, um, where generally the trans it would meet transition pits, which are to the west of the slipway, where they would then be joined uh, underground to the subsea cables. Members will also note that there are two yellow hatched areas, one within the caravan park and one within the open space, and these are generally indicative of what would potentially be used as the construction laydown areas and would effectively provide areas for um, material storage um, and also vehicle turning during the construction period. Um, there are two options for flexibility for the applicant. Um, and uh, I'll just turn on to show members the horizontal direction of drilling, which we'll also note will generally start from one or two of those areas, depending on which option is chosen. Um, and horizontal direction drilling will effectively involve uh, boring through the cliff out to the subsea area to uh, insert cables um, through the ground out to the offshore centre. In terms of proposed access improvements, uh, members will note that the existing access the proposal was to provide adequate visibility, 43 metres in both directions. And in order to, to achieve that, the hedgerows would be uh, cut back uh, to provide those displays. It is also proposed to widen existing access into the caravan site um, to provide a 5.5 metre width for the first 15 metres. After that, the existing access would then be utilised and that would run through into the existing um, pumping station site. Just to give members an idea of the relationship to existing neighbouring properties, this plan shows the distances to the nearest neighbours. So again, it's about 65 metres between the nearest point of the substation and Flowersbrook to the west, 53 metres to the properties to the north, um, and then properties to the northeast that overlook the open space, 79 and 91 metres respectively. 
Again, this plan shows members the indicative layout of the approved residential development uh, for the residential caravan site and showing the relationship with both substation. Generally, the substation would be located about one and a half metres at this point off the boundary, about two metres off this boundary, retaining the existing vegetation and hedgerow. And the report explains that it's proposed to lay this hedge and reinforce it to provide a tighter and more compact uh, screening uh, and enhance it both ecologically and, and visually. Uh, in terms of the relationship with the nearest property, the substation would be about five metres from this wall, um, its northern wall. Just um, finally, some photos just to show members um, the uh, views in, within the caravan park at site. So this is the existing access that runs through. You can see the pub substation here and the gated access that exists. This is taken across uh, the caravan park and it's looking north. So you can see the properties off Steep Hill Road uh, and further to north there. Um, and also the pumping station, you'll note, is, is here. Um, so again, you can see the undulating topography. Um, again, the final photo is looking towards the pumping station. The gated access is over here, roughly where the span is. Um, and again, you can see how the, uh, the, the contours generally fall uh, and then rise again to the south across the caravan site. So that's generally the, the end of the presentation, members. I would just uh, draw your attention to the officer update paper, which obviously recommends some updates to conditions 4 and 14. Thank you. Can we then go on to the speakers? And the first uh, speaker is Daniel James. Uh, you have three minutes, Daniel, to put your objections. Thank you. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Undercliff Community Group. We all understand the need for renewable energy, but P-Tech has generated not one watt of power, nor a single one of the hundreds of jobs promised despite a previous administration sinking a million pounds into this scheme. Local residents have suffered years of planning blight, not knowing if they will be living next to a noisy substation, or if the treasured public open space at Flowers Brook will be dug up, or if Steep Hill Cove will have emergency vehicle access cut off. This is a full application, not outline, yet after all the expense and uncertainty, vital details of the scheme are still unknown. Will the huge weight of the substation accelerate the landslip? The undercliff is still not open to vehicle traffic following the last landslip. Will 18 tonnes of flammable oil create a fire and pollution risk? Will the wildlife of this sensitive coastal habitat recover? Natural England said that the application could have an adverse effect on the integrity of the South White Maritime Special Area of Conservation. The applicant has conceded that an enclosure would be needed to prevent noise nuisance, but the design before the planning committee remains an open air compound. Complete redesign of the substation needs the application to be withdrawn, not controlled by the proposed condition 14. In June 2015, the split decision on the previous application stated, the proposed option one substation and temporary construction compound, by reason of their size, scale and location, within an exposed and elevated position would be intrusive and harmful additions that would compromise the visual amenity of the area of public open space, nearby footpaths and the landscape character of the surrounding area, contrary to policies SB5, DM2 and DM12. The AONB partnerships concerns meant option one was refused planning permission in 2015, yet here it is again. Please don't give option one planning permission this time. The truth about jobs and regeneration is that this substation would be an unmanned facility for most of the time. The number of car parking spaces in the scheme is three. As for safeguarding manufacturing jobs, the orbital O2 turbine, which PTEC has agreed to deploy, is made in Dundee. The SR2000 turbine in Orkney was built in 2016 and scrapped in 2020. A 30 megawatt experiment on the island is no longer needed. Yet the Southern Water Compound at Flowers Brook doesn't have the space for the 249 megawatt facility envisaged in the core strategy back in 2012. The elephant in the room turns out to be a white elephant. This planning application is simply too little, too late to bring the PTEC project and option one back from the dead. 
The local community requests that this inadequate application is refused planning permission and the blight on the homes ended today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. James. Uh, I now go on screen to Mr. Tony Flowers. You <clears throat> Are you there, Mr. Flowers? Would you like to log in? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can. Um, my name's Tony Flower. I'm a you, Travis. You've got three minutes, Tony. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Mr Chairman, um, I've been a Charlie Surveyor on the Isle of Wight for about 40 years and I've been dealing with property related development on the island for that time. I'm speaking today about Flowers Book and on behalf of the company that owns Flowers Book, which is uh, Red Squirrel Limited. Flowers Book adjoins this substation site. Flowers Book has planning permission for housing development. That's due to start shortly. And under this application, Flowers Book is now being recommended to you as the access to the substation site. The owners of Flowers Book wish to clarify the matter and this imposed planning condition. The owners are absolutely certain this proposal is causing and will continue to cause planning blight over the approved Flowers Book development scheme. Usually, it's good practice for an applicant to secure control over third party land prior to the submission of that application. The usual practice is to secure an option by agreement. That is not the case with this application. Instead, the application is riding the support and the goodwill of the planning authority. So my client is now putting the planning authority on notice as if a purchase notice has been served. That is that the applicant will only secure access over Flowers Book by acquiring the area blighted. My client would like the committee members to be clear on this planning position because it's different from the officer's report. The report recommends that the planning committee must rely on the imposition of a Grampian condition to facilitate access over third party property. This Grampian condition replies, relies on the planning committee being sure there is a prospect of the access being permitted. My client will not grant access to the application, but is open to a transfer of the title as the way to facilitate this scheme. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Powell. We now go to Mr. Dan Clare on behalf of the applicant. You have three minutes, Mr. Clare. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Daniel Clare and I am the Managing Director at RSK Acoustics. I'm here to hopefully allay some of the concerns and clarify a few points. I'm a corporate member of the Institute of Acoustics and I have 17 years of experience in noise and vibration, covering both local government and consulting. This year alone, I have been technical lead and continue to be technical lead for a number of um, similar substation and renewable projects across the country. And my team are the retained acoustic specialists for Scottish Power Energy Networks. In my experience, the approach to this assessment is no different to that of any other similar scheme across the UK. In simple terms, we have a development which will have a component that will emit noise. This is a fact. My team and I have provided a technical report that is based on industry standard methods to predict noise and the most appropriate British standards to assess the impacts. The prediction method takes account of environmental conditions such as terrain, meteorology, including wind, temperature and humidity, and has been reviewed by the Council's technical specialist. The noise model used in this method includes the exi existing houses, and it also includes the residential scheme currently consented to the um, west of the site. Through the study and the site walkover, I consider the prediction method to be accurate and robust and is a good representation of the proposed development. Throughout the process and in the assessment itself, we make it very clear that the assessment is based on educated assumptions of the equipment being used. 
At this stage of the project, the exact specification of the transformer equipment to be used is not known. The target levels of receptors will be set out in the planning conditions and it will be for us up to us to ensure our design can meet those levels once the specification is known, a design which will be in keeping with the existing design. The magnitude of these levels at receptors has not been questioned by residents or the council, and as such, I believe, they believe that these are accepted as a target which would not give rise to noise disturbance. Therefore, a condition with the noise levels referred to, with a requirement under planning condition to provide evidence to the council to show how these can be met, and an exercise through the commissioning process to show that these measures, these levels can actually be met in practice, will result in no impacts on the existing or future community. Therefore, the final design of the development will have noise control to a level that would not impact on the lives of those in the surrounding community. The final design will be reviewed and approved by the council technical specialists representing its residents. Thank you. Thank you. Rear Admiral Robert Stevens, on behalf of the applicant. Thank you. On. Um, thanks very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, I've been the chairman of PTEC and a passionate advocate of tidal energy for five years now. Uh, my intention today really is just to explain the project and its value to the, Britain, to the Isle of Wight and to Britain. Tidal energy, as you all know, I'm sure, works by placing an underwater turbine, like a wind turbine, in strong tidal streams. These streams turn the blades to make electricity. It's powered entirely by the island's tides, it's inexhaustible and it's predictable, and it's in harmony with the environment. The excess electricity can also be used to make green hydrogen, which in turn could be used as energy storage or power transport or for heating. It's the future. In consultation this, this year, 77% of the island's wider community respondents considered that tidal was an important source of green energy. Excitingly, we're on the cusp of making the Isle of Wight the home of Britain's first multi-megawatt tidal stream, sorry, England's first multi-megawatt tidal stream energy scheme. It will give a huge boost to the UK's leading tidal stream energy sector. The onshore substation we're discussing today is needed to connect that electricity to the grid. And we looked at a number of sites, but the one that had the least impact on the environment was Flowers Brook. This location presented an added benefit because the substation could be sited alongside the existing southern water pumping station in the same compound. Now, I should point out that we have resolved the access problem. I'm a little surprised at Tony's interjection, but under a Grampian condition, we are in advanced negotiations now with Wed Squirrel to purchase the land next door. So I believe we've resolved that issue. Turning now to timings. The MMO, in consultation with Natural England, gave consent for the offshore element of the site in 2016, but in the same year, government support was withdrawn to save money, and the project was put on hold until now, which explains the delays. Last month, the government was concerned about climate change and concerned about the energy hikes and reintroduced support for tidal energy within the Contracts for Difference, which in fact opened yesterday. Approval today would mean that PTEC and partners could apply for that generation contract by 2025 and be operational on that date. We bring new jobs, investment and delivered a giant leap towards the Council's stating ambition to achieve net zero by 2040. It was important, though, for us to listen to the concerns of the residents, which is why we have used an innovative architectural design, as you saw earlier, clever landscaping, and screening best practice to minimize the visibility and, as Dan has explained, an unobtrusive noise level. If we get approval today, our consents will actually take us forward and make us part of the solution for the Isle of Wight rather than the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I now have uh, the, well, the ward councillor, uh, Ms. Councillor Gary Peace, is not. Uh, able to be here and he asked uh, Councillor Peter Spink to speak. I, Councillor Spink is not online. Is he online? Uh, I've now been informed that uh, Mr Bolter is reading out the, the statement. Thank you. 
For many years, I have been broadly in favour of this project for the sake of energy security, the environment and our children's future. Clean energy is the way to go, and that includes enabling cleaner fossil fuels. It includes, without doubt, nuclear energy, and it also includes wind, solar and tidal power. However, the rush to embrace green energy should not be at the expense of or to the detriment of the economy or the environment. At a recent meeting I attended at the Ventnor Cricket Club to discuss PTEC, there were a number of presentations made by local people, business and speakers. The discussions were all well balanced and based on data and scientific evidence and they challenged the PTEC account. And although not a planning consideration, the viability of this project was not made out or proven by any stretch of the imagination. Opinion also seems to suggest that the PTEC project in Orkney, Scotland has failed also. It is very much for PTEC to answer and satisfy these concerns. They have had years to do so and have singularly failed in this respect. Commercial and technical viability aside, which is a, as a former engineer, I am sure in time will be answered. There are other significant issues to consider. One, questions about the noise impact have not been adequately addressed. The area is a beauty spot and a tourist attraction. Ventnor is one of the most deprived areas on the island and needs its beauty spots to attract and retain visitors. The level of the noise generated by this installation is significant and has not been adequately addressed in this application. Two, visual impact. The proposed building used to accommodate the infrastructure will tower over everything, however much PTEC try to disguise it. It will stick out like the proverbial sore thumb and will destroy this local beauty spot as an attraction. Three, the area will become an eternal building site for decades as the project develops. Visitors, families and children will have nowhere else to go that provides the space and freedom that this part of Ventnor does. I've spent many years with my family, our children and dogs enjoying Flowers Brook. This build and its development will mean that this green space will be lost to us all. Four, although there is evidence that sea life can be enhanced with subsea structures, the turbines will be sitting above the waterline and are immense in both scale and structure. This will utterly destroy the unspoilt and pristine sea views from Ventnor. And if anyone is aware of the wind turbines off the coast of Brighton, you will understand the visual impact this has on coastal views and the damage it does to tourism. Five, has anyone considered the effect that these structures will have on local fishing? Ventnor has a small and environmentally sustainable fleet of small fishing vessels. The turbines are due to be sited in the middle of the local fishing grounds causing significant and possibly catastrophic impact on the local fishermen who have been here for generations. Sustainable and local fishing will be the lifeblood post-Brexit, and sustainable fishing is also a key component in protecting the environment and our, the fish population. We could be about to ruin our ability to catch our own fish. Six. Lastly, one of the biggest annual attractions to the area is the Round the Island Yacht Race. Has anyone considered the impact on this iconic and world-renowned event? At the very least, the sighting of the turbines will push the race miles out to sea, defeating the whole object of the race as an attraction for sightseers. But it may even lead to the event not being run into the future because of maritime restrictions imposed to protect this site. This would be a catastrophic own goal and damage the island's reputation as one of the best sailing venues in the world. I respectfully, re respectfully request that this application be refused. Thank you. Uh, can I look to uh, yourself, Stuart? Do you want to reply or Ollie to any of those points made? No. I think most of it's covered in the report, Chen. Thank you. We're now actually uh, from uh, from members. Um, we do it in the usual three way. So if you've got any questions. Uh, you wish to ask. We'll then go into debate and then we'll go, uh, I'll then be asking for any proposals uh, from you. So is there any questions that members would like to ask? Councillor Quirk. Uh, in the presentations we've heard one presentation saying that there might be issues of the access and one saying that it's sorted. Uh, do officers have a view as to whether there is a reasonable prospect of access actually being there eventually? That's the first question. And the second one is the condition that relates to noise, which is one of the issues here, uh, is written in 
uh, sound engineer speak, and I haven't a clue what it means, and uh, would uh, appreciate some sort of interpretation of what that actually means in real life as to how you would hear it or not hear it. Very good questions. Mr. Bolter, you're going to ask first. Thank you, Chair. Yes, so to pick up on the first question from Councillor Quirk, I just refer back to the statement made by Mr. Flower on behalf of the landowner. Um, and it was the last part of his statement. And it said, as I have a transcript in front of me, this Grampian condition relies on the planning committee being sure there is a prospect of the access being permitted. My client uh, will not grant access to the to the applicant, but is open to a transfer of title that way facilitating the scheme. Um, so I think the question uh, for councillors this evening is whether in light of that statement, you consider uh, as set out in the report that that constitutes a prospect of it happening. I, I believe that, the, that those two statements corroborate each other. So, uh, thank you, Councillor Quirk. Um, in, ter in terms of sort of the jet, if I just give members a sort of rundown in my simple speak in terms of the noise situations, but effectively there was a noise impact assessment done by the applicant, as, as has been sort of referred to um, by the applicant's uh, noise consultant. Um, that uh, basically looking at the modelling um, for the from the transformer noise um, indicated that without mitigation, there would be a, a level was about 12 decibels above um, existing background levels and therefore there would at that level be a significant impact on neighbouring properties. Therefore it's proposed to mitigate that to reduce the levels at, at those times um, and the modelling has been done on a mitigated scenario which would include putting transformer enclosures around them um, and that has come out at um, the nearest residential property having a plus two decibels above background levels at night time. So the Environmental Health Officers reviewed it um, and, and effectively what that means in, in more simple terms is that it would be mitigated down to a low impact so it wouldn't be significant. Um, there will be additional mitigation because what that mitigation does or that modelling doesn't account for is that that nearest property that will be affected is the, is the proposed dwelling and actually there would be further mitigation by the, the, the walls of that building as well. So although the modelling has shown it to be two decibels above a background level, you know, the, the, the actual fabric of that dwelling would mitigate internal levels down below that level as well. If that makes sense. So um, effectively, the environmental health officer is satisfied with the levels that have, uh, have been indicated. Um, he has recommended conditions. We have put those conditions forward for members, um, which effectively specify decibel levels um, that would need to be met when measured one meter from the facade of those identified residential properties, including the closest uh, residential properties that are approved as part of the residential scheme. So the, the conditions require a pre-construction detailed acoustic design report and noise mitigation plan, which would set out the equipment that would be used, the noise associated with that, um, uh, the modelling associated with that, and then the, the proposed mitigation to make sure that prior to construction, what they're going to do is going to achieve those levels. Then there's a second condition, which effectively, once it's operational, they would do measurements at those receptors to demonstrate that they have met those levels. So that is how we are addressing it in, in those terms. Uh, the Environment Health Officers would happy with that approach, and obviously ourselves and he would be involved in reviewing those documents, reviewing those plans, uh, and being satisfied that the end result would not have a significant impact on neighbouring properties. Councillor Ward. Thank you, Jim. Um, Stuart, can I just go back on this subject of, of sound mitigation? Um, and, and you advise that we can get down to um, two, uh, what's the word? Two decibels um, above normal. If the site was constructed and we found that even two decibels was, was high, would it be possible to reduce that even further? Um, 
I guess, I mean, at the end of the day, the, the, we can put, I guess, whatever measures we, we want on, on the condition to be met. I mean, obviously, we would need to put down reasonable measures. Um, I, I guess I would defer that potentially to the acoustic consultant to answer that question, as he's more technically knowledge than not myself. But um, I, I would suggest to members that they may want to consider uh, what levels they deem to be reasonable. But, uh, you know, perhaps that question might be better directed to the experts. Sorry, no, uh, um, Councillor, uh, Mr. Bolter has to ask. Our, our uh, speakers have already spoken. Okay. So, thank you, Chair. I would just add to the information that uh, Stuart has provided, and I, I would just, um, I suppose, highlight uh, back to councillors that the, the council's own environmental health officer has reviewed this information, um, and they are and they do this on a regular basis, and they are satisfied with the information that has been submitted, and they have made their recommendations uh, accordingly. So, uh, certainly from the officer perspective, uh, and having gained that professional advice, we are satisfied uh, with the proposals and the mitigation uh, that will be sought through the proposed conditions. Thank you. If permission is granted for this, could it also be a condition that instead of the trenching works, we could insist that it's drilled? Because I just think environmentally that would be far less damaging to the site. Like to answer that? So apologies, I couldn't quite hear the question. Could you repeat the question, Councillor? If permission is granted, could it be made a condition rather than the trenching works, because I think these trenches are quite severe at three metres wide in such a lovely area, that it could be drilled. It must be drilled rather than trenched. I just think that would be far less damaging to the site. Get that? Yes, Chairman. Um, I think my answer, um, uh, Councillor, is that the, the applicant is asking for approval for both options. Um, both options previously have been deemed acceptable in this location. Um, the, yes, there are different pros and cons to both options, um, but, but again, there are pros and cons to both options. And I think, you know, uh, whichever option they choose, we have put conditions in to mitigate or any adverse impacts from those options, whether that be impacts on, on access or, or archaeology or, or whatever else um, you know, could be identified or, or ground stability. So we have considered the potential impacts of both options. Um, the, there is a condition about the construction management plan, which require them to set out their detailed construction methodologies with both options and how they would go about minimising impacts during the construction phase. Councillor Luciani. Um, was I right to understand that the it could be working by 2025? That's our understanding from, okay. from what the applicant just said, yes. Which is, which is great, because uh, we definitely need green energy um, looking at, especially with uh, the, the hydrogen that could come out of it. However, um, being such a beautiful site, does that mean that that area will become public and, and the same as it was, well, is now? Uh, yes, Councillor. The, the construction project is anticipated to last about 20 months. So, uh, uh, you know, upon completion, the land, the public open space in particular, will be restored. Um, we've got conditions to agree the restoration of that land. Um, so although it's temporarily used for construction, once the, the cabling has been done, that land will be backfilled um, and, and the site restored so it can be used by the public again. Councillor Christensen, and then Councillor Brody. Thank you, Chair. Could I have some um, just um, other details about the the obligation to secure the required biodiversity enhancement contribution, and is that instead of as as part of the uh, biodiversity gain that we be getting from applications? Is that I don't know, how is that going to be used? Is that going to be used in that area to? Um, ongoing management and things like that. I don't know. Just 
Thanks, Coach Kirchson. Uh, uh, we're currently finalising the legal agreement which secure that contribution. Uh, that contribution, uh, upon commencement of the development, would be paid to the council. Um, the council would then be able to draw down that money to utilise it um, for biodiversity enhancement schemes locally. Um, the legal agreement requires it to use within five miles of the site, so that would tie it to a, a relatively local uh, gain, ultimately. Thank you, Councillor Brody. Clearly, viability isn't a, a material planning consideration. But I recall sitting at the back of this committee nearly seven years ago when PTEC made an application for Flowers Brook with a packed public gallery, etc., etc., and approval was given. Seven years later, we're back in the planning committee considering an application by PTEC. My first question is. Are officers confident of the deliverability of this scheme? And secondly, can we limit the amount of time they have to do it? Currently, a planning approval would be for three years. Would we be able reasonably to reduce that to either 12 or 18 months? I have a second question, but I'll come to that. Answer. Uh. Thank you, Chair. Um, in response to your question, Councillor Brody, I think we would not normally look to go outside of the usual time frames um, for expecting uh, permission to be implemented, unless there are very good reasons to do so. Um, and you've also asked whether officers are confident of the delivery um, of, a, of an application. As, as you know, we have to assess the application in front of us and uh, take it on face value and based on, on the knowledge and information we have. So at this moment, I would say there is nothing that we have seen, I would suggest that would make us think that there is a reason why it shouldn't be delivered. Just coming back on that, Chair, if you don't mind, Within the, I know it's not it's not valid at the moment, but within the island plan, the draft island planning strategy, it is an aspiration of, of the current administration to put a stop to the number of ha of uh, planning applications that are approved that never get delivered. You know the number of particularly in housing terms, and I'm just I'm just concerned that nearly seven years later. People have been living in this community with effectively planning blight. I think it's a fair phrase. And we are likely, if we approve this, to put even more planning blight on them for up to three years. Because I know it's not a material consideration, but I have genuine concerns about the viability, given the financial position of this company, if anybody does any research into that. My second question is regarding the whole issue of the Grampian condition. Um, we got the report in front of us last Monday, I believe it was, yes, just a week in the day, last Monday. And the only evidence I had as an elected member regarding the Red Squirrel land was a letter on the council's planning website dated the 3rd of November from TF Property Solutions, which is Tony Flowers company who made representations against this application, though it does seem to me that since the report was submitted, things seem to have been moving. And I'm beginning to wonder, who can I believe here? Because I have a letter in front of me that says, please note there is absolutely no prospect of Red Squirrel entering into any settlement with PTEC. And then we heard Mr. Flower, the author of that letter, Sane and Council and Mr. Boulder read out, my client will not grant, but is open to a transfer of the title, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we heard the Rear Admiral, uh, Mr. Stevens, say that they're in negotiations. I don't know who I believe in all of this, to be frank. And the clear situation is, if there is absolutely no prospect of Red Squirrel entering into a settlement. A Grampian condition is inappropriate, as, as planning officers know. So I would just like a bit of direction here, Chair, because I do feel I'm being 
you know, for want of a better word, a bit conned here. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Volter, you have to answer this. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think I would just simply highlight, Councillor Brodie, that as you said, there was a position uh, by one of the interested parties as at the 3rd of November, and it would appear that that position has moved on. And I would uh, take the most up to date uh, information direct from that uh, interested third party uh, to be the most up to date and relevant position. Thank you, Chair. Um, I can, I've got a concern over the um, lay down areas. Um, obviously, the, the one of the lay down areas is going to take up the best part of the green area, um, which is obviously going to be used summer wise and things like that. Are we able to restrict the lay down area um, if it's only going to be used? You know, they're both classed as extensions. Surely one must be the preferred lay down area um, to, you know, to, to the other. Able to answer that? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Again, we have recommended a construction management plan, which would they would set out the construction areas, um, and we can agree the the the, yeah, the extent of that set up for that, um, alongside the other considerations, which would be things like minimising the impacts on rights of way, um, uh, the you know, and, and minimising the incursion into that open space. I think yes, there are two options, but the the application is there for flexibility. So at the end of the day, we've heard from Councillor Brody about deliverability. So the the greater we have in terms of flexibility, um, that helps with the deliverability of the scheme so you know then yes the, the, the lay down the option two within the green area would impact on the green area uh, and would take out commission for about 20 months um, but it overall it is temporary um, and i think members will need to obviously weigh that impact against um, other benefits to the scheme can yeah, I can do, please, Chair. Um, the also, um, you're following on from what Jeff was saying about viability. Um, if this all goes pear shape um, and we are left with a blight, um, you know, with with the green all dug up and everything else, are are we in a position where we can actually insist on a bond or some undertaking? Look, the works, the the land will be returned to the position it's in now. Should the yeah, should the company fail um, to deliver once halfway through their their build project? Good. Yeah, I say um, uh, ultimately we can uh, we can agree um, through the construction man management plan, the schedule, uh, and the proposed program for those works. Um, you know, should those works cease, um, ultimately um, it is council land. Um, so whilst it may be well be outside the um, um, the remit of, of this project, obviously, they will require agreement to utilise that green space through the council. So, um, you know, through the conditions, uh, we can ensure that um, that site is restored. Uh, but also, you know, we own that open space. Or, you know, we, we have uh, control over that open space in terms of restoration of that land as a council. So I think that should give them a little more confidence in terms of that being restored, you know, should things not tran you know, transpire as we would like them. Thank you, Chair. I have concerns over the tourism use of the area because it's a high tourism area. Are we, with the diversions and closures of the rights of way that pass around there, are they going to be during our high tourism months? And we have got conditions to ensure that there is always access and it's not going to affect anything like that, those times. Again, uh, yeah, uh, rights of way have commented on the application. Obviously, their, their preference is for minimal disturbance to the rights of way, and obviously that benefit tourism. In, in terms of the actual con the construction plan, we'll set out their methodologies and their timings. And obviously, there's a balance that we need to be struck because we've got various aspects of the scheme. So, for instance, removing the coastal works during um, the off season, if you like, is probably the higher risk for flood risk in terms of taking out coastal works, whereas actually um, doing the works in the summer months has greater impacts in terms of tourism and amenity. So, you know, we would hope through a construction management plan that the programme schedule be set out and the timings of those would be, would be set out to strike an appropriate balance between impacts on amenity and tourism, but also, you know, minimising risks in terms of land stability and, and, and flood risks and, and those sorts of things. Uh, I might have missed something here. Getting back to Martin's question with regards to bond, 
with what you're saying with the land being reinstated because it's council land, I can, uh, I've no problem with that. But I think the point Martin was trying to make, and correct me if I'm wrong, was it that I would like to think that it would be a no cost to the council? Is this something that we could guarantee that if it did go wrong, there would be no cost to the council? That's as I understood Martin's question regarding the bond. Mr. Paul, Thank you. Um, I think from uh, the advice that, that Stuart has, and the point that Stuart has made on that is there is, I suppose we could describe it as a, a double uh, lock uh, protection to the council to address these concerns. The first uh, mechanism that we have is uh, through the land use planning process and so in terms of the conditions uh, that have been suggested with the permission. The second one is that then uh, through a separate process, the council as a landowner will need to agree the terms of access and, and I'm sure will be mindful of any concerns that have been expressed um, through the questions and debate this evening. Thank you. I'm going to move it now to debate. Any member wish to contribute to that debate? Look. The island or the, the council voted unanimously to support the green island concept. Uh, green energy is vital to that. Um, tidal energy is uh, predictable, consistent, and green, uh, much more so than, than wind turbines or even uh, solar panels. So it's, uh, uh, it seems of something that we should intrinsically be supporting. Uh, and I do support it. And I would move that we uh, accept the officer recommendation uh, to grant planning permission. Forward as a proposal for approval. Do I have a seconder for that? Uh, Councillor Ward. Oh, we well, actually have Councillor Luciani. Are you seconding Councillor Luciani? She put her hand up first. Councillor Ward. Thank you, Chairman. Um, as, I, as I walked down the hill to the green, my first reaction was surely we're not going to build on that. OK, but when I got down to the bottom of the hill, I realised I'd bought, actually walked past the Southern Water Pumping Station and it had made very little impact upon me. Yes, I could see it through the trees, but it made no impact. And then in the course of our visit, um, it was explained to us that the installation would actually be within the same compound, surrounded by the same stone walls um, and, and screened by trees as well. OK, so... Um, on that basis, I, I think that is acceptable. Um, going back to the green energy issue, uh, this council rejected an application um, for oil drilling in Ariton and a fossil fuel. And we need to be flexible. If we are going to reject fossil fuel, then we must be sympathetic to green energy, a renewable energy. So on that basis, I will support this application. Do I have any others who wish to speak? Me? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, you probably detected in my questions that I have an element of scepticism about this company, and I'll believe it when I see it. But there is no doubt that we need renewable energy on the island. There's absolutely no doubt about it. I think the location is very sad that this would happen to Flowers Brook, to be honest. Um, but I think we have to start supporting green energy. Not only you know, did I see the last application for this, some years ago I saw the rejection of wind turbines on the Isle of Wight, which I, I think was a significant mistake, personally. Uh, it was massively, uh, massively controversial at the time. In fact, two applications, one at Wellow and one near Parkhurst Forest, as I recall. But I think, uh, in, on, in, on, on reflection, that they should probably have been approved. And having stood practically next to wind turbines around the country, there, there have never been of any issue as far as I could see. I will support this application 
but I would like us to try and put some stronger conditions on it than are presented to us tonight. But Councillor Oliver has, has suggested the possibility of a bond, and Councillor Adams has also referred to that as well. I think we should be insisting on a bond to restore Flowers Brook back to its current state if this company starts and fails to finish within a certain period of time. So I think I would ask officers to try and come together with something that is a reasonable condition regarding a bond. I'd also like to limit the time they've got to start this. Because, uh, as I say, I'm entirely sceptical about it. And I think it's entirely unfair to blight the people who live near this for up to three years. And I would like to propose that that is reduced to 18 months. So, therefore, I will be speaking for it. I don't know if anybody will second me on this, but I would like to see a bond condition and I would like to see a limit to 18 months before they have to start something there. OK, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just ask uh, Mr Bolter to respond to Councillor Brodie and then I will come to you, Councillor Oliver. Can you respond to Councillor Brodie? Yes, thank you. What I'm going to do, Chair, if it's all right, is I'm going to ask uh, Russell Chick uh, to provide some advice on this matter, given that his experience relating to minerals applications, so that the, the similarity of, of the issues and making good. So, uh, Russell. Mr Chick. Thank you. Yes. Hopefully the speaker's working. Yes, it is. Uh, in, in terms of bonds, we, we discussed this, if you remember, in, in October in relation to the Ariton oil application. Um, bonds are used in exceptional circumstances. The MPPF makes it very clear that they should only be used in exceptional circumstances. They're generally for schemes where um, the works are to take place for a very long time or there's some sort of novel approach in relation to the development and therefore there's some uncertainties in relation to it. And that, that generally relates, though, to the method of working and not the actual financial background of a company. So generally, bonds are for exceptional circumstances. And I don't think in this case, given the size of the development and that its construction technique is, is pretty normal and, and being used elsewhere, that a bond would be justified. Um, in terms of the time limit, I, I think you have to look at the background to this development. So this development would require uh, government grants, which have got to be applied for and secured. That could take 18 months, and therefore giving the permission phase only three years could, could really cut the legs from um, the underneath of the scheme. I mean, in terms of the background, um, yes, it was granted seven years ago. Unfortunately, at the exact time the development was granted, the government withdrew the grants for offshore renewable energy development. Now, the government has now put those back in place, and I think that's important in terms of the background of this case, because the reason it stalled for seven years was because of those grants. Um, but ultimately, there are conditions recommended in, in the report, which will require quite detailed submissions, um, which in themselves may take 18 months for submission and an agreement. So I think you know, that, that three-year timescale is probably right for this development. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Brother, you're putting forward... An uh, amendment. Well, I mean, I hear what's said. I'm not getting a second, but everything I've just heard means that I will have to vote against this application because I think you're imposing something that will never happen on the local people, and I can't vote for that. Thank you. Uh, you wanted to speak. Thank you, Chair. I was actually going to second um, Jeff's proposition. Um, <laughs> I hope you haven't withdrawn it, Jeff. Um, the, the, um, the, I think this is an exceptional circumstance. The seven years from the first application to now um, is a long time. And I, I think we need to be put in some sort of um, security around the, 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 the landscape and the seascape, if you like, of the area. Um, so I would disagree you know, with respect um, to Mr. Jick. Um, I think this is an exceptional circumstance as far as that's concerned. 
Um, slightly disagree with, with um, Councillor Brody on the 18 months it, from what you've just said there, but I think we should be restricting it to something like 24 months then if there's going to be um, 18 months of talking and things like that. We need to put some sort of pressure to make sure this happens. If it doesn't, it needs to be kicked out sooner rather than later. My, my amendment to 24 months then, but also requiring a bond. Uh, you put forward it to second the councillor Oliver. Do you second that? Second that proposition. I'm going to actually have a um, five minute break so that officers can uh, catch up with you, <laughs> with your suggestions. Okay. And uh, we also probably need a comfort break as well. So five minute break. Thank you.
everybody in the room? Is there anybody missing? Rui, are you able to start again? Okay. Uh, I think we have a way uh, forward. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Chick to respond to Councillor Brodie's and Councillor Oliver's um, amendment, which is still there at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Yes. So in terms of um, a shorter time limit, um, generally a time limit placed on a planning permission is three years. Um, and the advice given to planning authorities in the national planning guidance is that um, planning authorities can consider variation in the time period. But that's normally to assist the delivery of development or where a shorter time period might be relevant where you wanted to encourage commencement um, for some reason, i.e previous non-commencement has caused some sort of harm. Now, from what I'm hearing from the comments made through, through the debate, um, the harm is, is the idea that there may be a permission out there that could be commenced at some point, that sort of sort of Dam Damocles hanging over, over someone. That's not really evidence of planning blight. That's not really evidence that would justify shortening um, the time limit for a planning permission. In fact, in this um, scheme, it might be counter to the development because of the complexity of the information that's needed um, to, to be submitted to the planning authority for agreement with consultees to then allow a spade to be put into, a gra into the ground. Um, so you know, my advice would be that in this case, shortening the time limit wouldn't be relevant to this application. It may be unreasonable behaviour. Um, in terms of a bond, um, as I've said, the MPPF is very clear. The bonds should only be used in very exceptional circumstances. Um, when you compare this proposed development to other sites on the island, such as the mineral site out at um, Hale Common in Arreton, for example, those sites generally don't have bonds on them. And that's because of this exceptional circumstance. There are tests in the MPPF of when bonds should be used. And it says about very complex developments or novel approaches to development. I think when you look at this development, the actual scheme is quite small. It's, it's limited to an area. Um, the potential harm, for example, to Flowers Brook would be excavation of some land for the construction phase and some trenches. And when you look at actually the extent of work required to then backfill and then receive that area, it's not extensive. So um, opinion as a planning officer is that a bond wouldn't be reasonable in this circumstance. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Stuart, can you come, Mr. Stuart, if you can come in. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, I uh, say so the, the other way we, um, potentially we can address some of Councillor Brodie's concerns is by, um, by beefing up the construction management plan. Um, and um, members will, will note from the submissions that actually the trenching option, for example, is supposed to be dealt with in phases. Um, so the idea being that in order to minimise disruption to open space and, and public rights way, that they would trench specific minimal sections and then move on to the next section and the next section. So um, what, what I've um, uh, proposed is a as an alternative wording to the construction management plan. Um, so um, within the update paper that members were given, that was the latest version of that construction man management plan condition, condition four. Um, so what I suggest is um, on the third bullet point within that condition, um, where it says measures to be followed during construction to minimise land stability risk to be included within the construction management plan, to add and those to minimise disruption to the public open space, um, and then I propose adding a bullet point at the end of that list to include that the construction management plan will include a restoration scheme for the public open space, um, Flowers Brook, to include timings of the restoration of that space upon completion of cabling and construction works. And then at the very end of that condition, where it says development shall be carried out in accordance with the construction management plan and any approved mitigation or enhancement shall be carried out and completed in accordance with agreed timings to then add a very specific uh, sentence that says restoration of the public open space, Flowers Brook, shall be carried out and completed in accordance with the approved scheme by the end of two years following commencement of the construction works. Okay, I 
Councillor Brody, are you? Have you got that? <laughs> Councillor. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's not ideal, you know, but I mean, I, I'm not going to push for anything that, uh, that's unreasonable here. And I mean, uh, you know, and I, and I value the advice given by planning officers on, on the application. Uh, what I propose to do, and I've discussed with Councillor Oliver, who seconded it, is, is to withdraw my, uh, my uh, original amendment regarding a bond and two years. And I've also discussed with the proposer of the original uh, approval motion, Councillor Quirk, that he will accept what, Council, what Mr Van Kylenberg has just said in terms of amending the construction management plan, because I think that'll go a long way to, to allaying some of my fears about this. Though I will still say I'll believe it when I see it. Thank you. You agree to that withdrawal? Yes, Chair, I agree to that. Uh, and I confirm that I agree to that. I agree to accepting that being incorporated into the resolution. And uh, Councillor Newsend, you second it. Are you okay with that? Yes, yeah. Okay, well, we'll go straight to the you vote. Those for the uh, vote for approval, subject to the wordings that have just been read out. Those in favour of the, please can show hands. Those against, I think, none. Uh, abstentions? Abstentions? No. Uh, it is approved. Thank you. We now go on to item five. Uh, members' questions. Do we have any members' questions? Do you see any No. Is that? No. I think uh, we'll close the meeting. And I will uh, just thank uh, everybody and staff, team, and members, and speakers for this evening. And as it's the last panel meeting, I wish to wish you all a very merry Christmas and a happy festive season. Thank you. <laughs>